I think it was the same reaction that many people had, that it was a delightful idea, that it was a clever idea. The first time I heard of the idea, the Four Corners piece, um, it was a good idea. But the important thing was that it be done. Um, there are lots of good ideas out there. Few of them get done. Having known David for 15 years at that time, uh, I realized that it wasn't just talk, that he was probably going to do something about it. Four Corners Project began as a series of ideas that I thought about while I was constructing my home. For almost a year I was working constantly, building the house and studio. Not being able to realize my sculpture, I found myself preoccupied with ideas for a conceptual project. What would happen if I would combine the least-sided geometric form, the tetrahedron, it has only four sides, with the most-sided form, the sphere? A sphere inside a tetrahedron touches at four points, and a tetrahedron inside a sphere touches at four points. I suppose the realization was in discovering that the sphere could be the earth. The idea then would just be to implant four corners in the earth. The imaginary planes that connect these corners would create an invisible geometrical structure, a tetrahedron which is inside the earth and 6,464 miles apart. So I contacted John Nystuen, who was head of the uh, geography department at University of Michigan. And I described the problem to him that I had to find the exact coordinates. There was a long pause over the phone while he probably was debating whether or not I should be institutionalized. And um, I said, look, don't make a decision right now. I'll send you some materials and think it over. And I sent them to him. And about a week or so later, he said he was very interested. And he's been involved ever since. And, and what we found... I had determined the four corners would be placed in Easter Island, correct. South Africa, Guinea, Greenland, Kalahari, and New Guinea. And Greenland. And John see, calculated Guinea the precise the coordinates. So we put I chose those point, coordinates as opposed to several others because I wanted the corners in areas untouched by Western technology. I wanted them in remote areas in order to bridge our diverse cultures. A long longitude, then down latitude. I think this is a heroic undertaking because uh, it's a combination of, uh, of science and art. And I think it would remain a, a sort of uninteresting exercise of mathematicians and geographers uh, a technical problem if it wasn't for the fact that David Barr really intended to go. And this really surprised people when, they, when I said, he needs to know the exact spots because he's going there. And people said, yeah, he's going to the Greenland ice cap and to the uh, New Guinea uh, uh, mangrove swamp and out in the Kalahari. Uh, that would be very heroic. We went to Machu Picchu first, perform a ritual cleansing. I washed myself, I washed the corners. That was our gate of entry. My wife Beth is a dancer. She performed a dance there that was about opening and beginnings. We can now proceed to the Four Corners. Dancing at the sites was a very interesting experience. As a choreographer, it was a new experience for me. I had been used to ballet. I had been used to um, dance, doing other people's dances. And so um, I worked with our director, uh, the director of our dance company, the Nance Dance Ensemble, and that was Denise Sakula. And she helped me learn how a dance is made, how it's put together. So it was a new experience for me. Easter Island is the most remote culture on Earth. I chose it because it's a very powerful culture in terms of its art. It's known as the navel of the world. 
and that seemed to be a good spot to give birth to the project. Our guide on Easter Island was Mario Arevalo. He had worked with Thor Heyerdahl on Easter Island. Mario gave us instruments, transits, other surveying instruments in order to establish our first point. Mario ended up very involved in the project and enthusiastic about it. In Africa, the point ended up in a farm called Kariboom. The family there accepted us, even though the project seemed quite mad to them, and they they welcomed the project onto their land, which must have been a kind of invasion for them. The planning of the corners has always been on my knees. It's a solemn, humbling time for me. I discovered my sister was dying before the project began. I dedicated the project to her. In Greenland, we had to fly 400 miles inland to what turned out to be the highest plateau on the ice cap. It was exhilaratingly beautiful and also the most barren place I've ever experienced. We saw unbelievable things. A geyser squirting up about 150 feet. We flew the plane right into it. It was fabulous. Just an amazing sensation. Well, the most memorable part of the Greenland experience for me was actually the plane ride out to the point. It was uh, several hours. The drone of the engine was something that isolated me, kept David and I from talking and the, and the pilots, and so it was a time, a couple of hours in which I just got into myself. I was carrying these tokens, these mementos that people had given us that they wanted buried at the point. Um, and they were, there were some very emotional kinds of things, some letters, some, some tokens and, and things that people uh, it ha it had a lot of emotions invested in them. And I, I felt the burden of carrying those things out. Um, it was like going to the end of the earth. It was like going to Hades. Um, and uh, at one point, I, I, I actually cried because I just felt so oppressed and heavy um, about, about going there. It was kind of anticlimactic because as we reached the point, uh, it clouded over and the pilot said, we're not going to be able to land. Uh, will you seriously consider just dropping the thing out the window? But a as we actually got to the coordinates, there was a hole opened up and, uh, and he uh, decided to go down, to put the thing down. The plane, once touching down, couldn't get back up. We couldn't get airspeed enough to lift the plane back off. While Jim Pallas and I implanted the point, the uh, pilot, Patty Doyle, dug the plane back out of the snow, emptied it of survival gear and gasoline. For a while there, we certainly felt our life was in some kind of jeopardy, and we weren't sure whether we were going to get off at all. Ultimately, we did which was a especially joyful feeling. And a lot of people have said, well, since this is a conceptual project, why don't you just write it up, exhibit the notes of it, and let it go at that. I think my feeling about that has been that that's very egotistical and too easy, and that I wanted to do something that's more substantial and actualizing it to make it a, a vivid metaphor of some kind. That's proven to be, uh, from my point of view, a good judgment because that's what's drawn people in. The actualizing of it is what uh, made the project live with so many other people. Nance Dance Ensemble, for instance, developed a whole new dance for the Four Corners Project. David had designed Sunset Cuban and built it and installed it at the Meadowbrook Sculpture Garden at Oakland University. NASA's director, Denise Sakula, and I discussed the Four Corners project and we began to design a dance inspired by the project. 
The dance continued to grow and change and develop as the project unfolded. Struggles have just always been part of the project, I think, financially, physically, emotionally. Uh, they've just been going along with it all together. Financially, it costs way more than anything I ever could have imagined. And physically, of course, it's been, there have been some uh, difficult things about traveling, difficult things about making travel arrangements to various countries and to charter planes and trying to find somebody who would even do it. By the time we were actually underway to Jakarta, I had a cloud of anxiety, of doubts, of fears, I suppose, that were due to the four years of frustrations. But it was a cloud that couldn't be blown away until I had actually stepped on Irian Jaya, old New Guinea soil. On the plane on the way to Irian Jaya, we were overcome by the unknown, not knowing what the people would be like or what would meet us at the other end. Well, in Jakarta, we had to go to various bureaus of the Indonesian government to, in person, clarify where we were going. We suddenly realized we had to enter their time frame and their, their processes and their ways of going about it. And um, to meet the liaison that would travel with us. Meeting the embassy people I found somewhat comforting that they were enthusiastic once we were there, they were helpful. I would say that they seemed cautious that we would be successful, but at the same time, encouraging. Those are the spots, it was John Nice Jr. In Jayapura, we had a whole set more of frustrations, connections not really being clear, but uh, one by one, those things sort of fell into place. On MacArthur's beach, Jim played his harmonica, and I began to dance. We both felt a surge of euphoria. Jim and his wife, Janet, and I had been good friends, but at that moment, it was as though we became relatives. Certainly there were ghosts at that place. Jim's uncle Harry and my two uncles, Tony and Danny, had landed at that beach during the Second World War. The next day I found out that my father was dying. At the moment I was doing that dance. The death of Beth's father was a huge shadow for me that fell across everything. And I now, in retrospect, realize that to some degree it was functioning almost out of shock from then on, that there was this will that went on, but a lot of things were underneath that shadow. It seemed painful, of course, and, and sad, and yet uh, I think Beth, her ability to mourn in private, a willingness to put it aside for the sake of the project is certainly something that I'll always remember and always treasure about her. I think probably one of the first sets of things when leaving to complete any of the corners and certainly leaving to complete the last corner with all sorts of speculations and dreads and then anticipating disaster and anticipating problems and 
wondering indeed if we were going to be successful, if, um, if we'd be stopped at some further point. Uh, again, I never quite believe it until we're on the actual site in the region. I'm always half anticipating some new, new thing coming up. The plane ride itself was sensational. You realize that when you get up out of out of Jayapura, which is hardly a, a large community, that 10 seconds outside of it, you're in total jungle, and it's unrelieved all the way until you get to these past tiny settlements at best. But uh, you realize just how vast and unsettled and raw the whole country is. Certainly it was one of the great moments of my life, I think, was to come in and see Dan O'Vera and know that we were going to get there. And uh, here was the, it was just such a beautiful lake. And, uh, the whole sense that it was going to be there seemed quite right to me. It seemed like it was a uh, special place, obscure, protected by obscurity, protected by uh, the vastness of the land, and yet uh, people with you know, a handful of very friendly human beings. That was of a special significance to me. This was the only place that I've visited where I felt that I was truly the foreigner. The people looked at us as though we were from another planet. They were fascinated by us, and we were equally excited and fascinated by them. symphony of insects. I can't believe it. We're here. This is it. itself does not belong is not to just man. burying the corner man belongs but an to expression the of All dance tribal connected. poetry like the reading of reverential itself. prayers by longtime friends by and Native the new America friends that we've met along Seattle the journey in, in a sense it's it's leaving relics of all of the arts the project is a way of giving form and visualizing our global interconnections. 
that which we share as humans, art, death, communication, struggle, joy. Art, to be meaningful, must resonate in the human mind and heart. The stimulus, whether it is an object, a sound, an image, a sensation, or an idea, exists independently. The Four Corners Project doesn't fire human imagination. It ceases to exist. But as long as it is carried by one human, it does exist. In this, it resembles the memory of a being. In this, it resembles love. There was a feeling from the very beginning before we left for Erie and Jaya of a death. Death is a part of this project, but not for its morbidity, but to acknowledge it as a fact. We are brothers in death. We treasure life as death's witness. Art is a small, tiny human triumph over death. Putting the corner in for me is, is saying goodbye to my sister, to Paul Dwayne, my father-in-law. In a way, it's saying goodbye to people I love who are no longer here. In a way, it's saying goodbye to itself, to the project. It's learning how to let it go. And all the sites, I want to be the last to leave. And I just want a split second to be alone here. Feel the power of the peace throughout the earth. To feel myself not standing on flat land, but infinitesimally placed on a globe, on a sphere whirling in space. project, which is a tetrahedron inside of the globe, is in my mind a symbol of the core of life. In this case, it's about all of the wonderful human beings that I'm indebted to for helping me complete this project. <laughs>